Yeah, well, yeah, thanks for joining me here today and hopping into the lighthouse where we're going to dive into kind of a really specific integration, which is Readwise, a very amazing app that we will be learning about and how it integrates with this app called Obsidian. That'll be the big focus. I'm sure we're going to go on a few tangents and rabbit holes, bunny trails, and all sorts of things in between, but we'll also leave this call, I'm sure, figuring out how to use this integration and how to optimize it. So I'm really looking forward to that. Just to kick things off, um, I know many of you have probably heard of Readwise, but we all are still a pretty small niche product. So I'm assuming that a bunch of you haven't heard of it. So just to give some context before I jump into our Obsidian integration, I just want to explain what Readwise is and what Readwise does. So I started Readwise with my co-founder, Tristan, he might be in here, I'm not sure, uh, back in 2017. Um, so we've been working on this for about four years now. And what Readwise initially did, it was a browser extension that you would install in Chrome and it would make it easy for you to get your Kindle highlights. Um, so if you guys read on a Kindle device, every time you take a highlight, assuming it's a book that you've purchased from Amazon, that highlight is then synchronized into the cloud at this webpage, read.amazon.com slash notebook. Um, and while that's cool, Amazon makes it really hard for you to export your highlights from that page. Like you can go in there and you can kind of like manually cut and paste them, but uh, it's kind of hard to manage. So our Chrome extension would go and do that for you in the background when the browser was open, uh, make it easy to liberate those highlights. And then once we had those highlights, then we would help you get some value out of them by our first value prop and what we started Readwise with, which was a, a, a feature we call the daily review. Um, and it would just be an email of a random assortment of five highlights sent to you every morning. And people really love that and resonated with it. Um, and over time, we started to add more and more reading apps. Kindle is like 80 to 90% of the ebook space, but people are doing a lot of other forms of digital reading. Going to uh, the dashboard now to show you all the different sources that we support. Um, so, you know, after we had Kindle, then we added Apple Books. Unfortunately, it's a little less convenient with Apple Books than with Kindle. We added Google Play Books. We added the, the read it later apps like Instapaper and Pocket, which wow. have highlighting. We added Twitter. So you can save both individual tweets as well as Twitter threads, uh, Medium. And, and we just expanded all the different sources. So now uh, we became kind of like a, a Zapier or like middleware that would make it easy for you to gather all your highlights into one place. And once we started doing that, then around like late 2019, 2020, there was this explosion in the note-taking space, you might call it, or maybe like the tools for thought space or personal knowledge management. Everyone has their own term. And people started asking us, like, well, now that we have all our highlights in one place, we want to get them into our note-taking tool. Um, so we started with, you know, the OG note-taking tool, Evernote. Um, and then we added Notion and Roam. Um, Obsidian has obviously stormed onto the scene over the past year. I personally love Obsidian. That's what I use for my own uh, note-taking tool. Um, and then they, they made their plug-in uh, system publicly available to developers like us a couple of months ago. And um, as of last week, we officially shipped our um, Readwise official plugin. Uh, there were a couple of community plugins that would tap into the Readwise API to import your highlights, but we made our own, um, which has a couple key uh, differences, which I'll show you through right now. But before I move on, anything I, I left out for your audience, Nick, or you think that was good? I mean, I think it's good for me right now. That's It's a nice overview. And that's the thing, like Readwise, you've always struck me as um, a brand that I trust. And I used it several years back. Um, and then just because of the nature of what I was up to, moving to the entertainment industry, focusing more on crafts and trades and that sort of thing, I, I didn't need the functionality. And then coming back to it now and seeing what you're doing with this Obsidian plugin, that's kind of re-inspired uh, my, my love of well-made apps like yours and how it can fit into the workflow. Uh, 
So I'm kind of excited to jump into the integration as well. This is That's a great awesome. overview. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, before Obsidian, we also had a, a markdown export that a lot of our users were using. You could turn all your highlights into a zip folder of markdown files and then import them into Obsidian. But uh, that obviously had a lot of drawbacks, namely, you do it once and it's great, but what happens when you start reading thereafter? So that's what this plugin exactly. aims to solve. So this is a fresh um, Obsidian Vault on my machine with no real customization other than I've already ran the plugin once. Um, just to give you an idea, I have 35,000 highlights. So the, it does take <laughs> a little bit, here you can see, well, I think it'll say my number of highlights here. So it takes a little bit of time to run 36,000 highlights now. Um, so I, I ran it right before this. Um, and here you can see the output. But before I get into there, um, I think everyone here is advanced enough to know how community plugins work and to go and search for it. Uh, there are a couple Readwise plugins. Ours is the one called Readwise Official. Um, here you can see our README. We'll be adding mm -hmm. community resources down here as folks make helpful like walkthroughs and guides as to how they use the plugin. Uh, and then once you install it, there'll be a screen before this. It'll only have one call to action, which will be connect to Readwise. You click that, it'll take you to um, this page right here, the Obsidian page. It will connect and then you have to come back to Obsidian to run the sync. And you run that by hitting initiate sync, or you can also do it from the command panel you just search for Readwise, you can do sync your data now, and it will do your first export. Depending on how many highlights you have, that may take a couple minutes, or if you don't have many, mm -hmm. uh, it should be relatively instant. And so for, for people using Obsidian, um, what Daniel hit there, and one of, I hope you're using this already, but one of those awesome, awesome hotkeys is Command P, which pulls up the command palette. And that way you don't have to remember uh, the command, what was it? How do I find sync? And all you have to remember is readwise, very easy to remember, and then sync your data now. So command P or on a Windows, it's, is it alt? Control or P. Control, okay. There, awesome. I, uh, I come from the world of finance where I got locked into Microsoft Excel. So I'm still on a Windows machine to be made fun of by everyone on our team, but it is what it is. <laughs> I get it. I get it. Yeah. So, you know, that's all you need to do to get started with the plugin. Um, it obviously has a lot more depth from there if you want to go in and customize things to your bespoke preferences, uh, which if you're using Obsidian, you probably are that kind of power user that has a specific format in mind. And there's, there's no way to anticipate all of them. So I think the major feature um, of this export is this ability to use custom formatting. Um, by default, it's toggled off, but you can toggle it on. And what you get is a whole templating engine where you can go and tweak a majority of the output. Um, so you can get this dialed into your own preferences. Uh, it was very interesting when we, we first shipped a private beta of this just to get initial feedback. Uh, we had no idea that this whole data view plugin, like YAML front matter thing was a, a thing in Obsidian, but uh, that was overwhelming feedback early on. So for example, um, if you use the data view plugin or you use YAML front matter, you can come down to this section here, you know, and begin filling in your, your front matter, however you want. Um, you can also change the title. Um, so that'll be the first line on any of the exports if I turn this into edit mode. Uh, right now I have it to be a heading one with the title of the book. Uh, then there's a whole section called page metadata. This is another thing that our plugin does. Um, that's kind of hard to replicate in the open source world just because we've been aggregating um, hundreds of millions of uh, highlight data. It, so here you can insert the author name. You can see that I've chosen to use the wiki link around it. You can insert the full title. What that means is a lot of titles have like a, a short title and then they've got like a colon plus subtitle. So this would be the, the longer title. Um, then you can have the category, right? That would be like a book article, podcast, tweet, whatever. Um, then within Readwise, we have a concept of document tags. So a tag that you can apply to the book or the article. I Just personally taking one, one step back there. So with category, that's also something that Readwise is interpreting. Is that accurate? That's right. So in your library, 
let me see the best place I've got three of these open. Um, so in your library, we, we in general will interpret like a tweet as a tweet um, as a category, but you can come in and you can adjust, you know, what the category is. Um, sometimes like a PDF will be interpreted as an article when it's actually a book or whatnot, but you can come in and tweak that. And then when it's exported to Obsidian, uh, it'll have the updated tag here. And I use the tag, the hashtag convention for, for this, which is like a nice to have and nice to filter on, but I, this is my personal preference of just how I use hashtags versus wiki links. And then document tags are kind of the same thing. Um, whoops, wrong one. I can come in here and I can add a document tag to the top. Uh, and then finally, there's the URL of the document. That would be if it's an article or something. So that way you can go back to the original source and check it. And that's, that's page metadata. Then we get into this thing called the highlights header, um, which is probably the least intuitive section on this page. But if you go into here, you'll notice that, you know, we have the title, which we talked about. We have the metadata, which included this book cover, which looks nice in preview mode. Uh, this right here is the, what's known as the highlight header. So it's separating my highlights beneath it um, from everything above it. And then if I were to continue reading this book after I did an initial export, it would insert a new header beneath it, um, which gets into a really important topic. You can see this new highlights added. It gets into a really important topic because when people export their, their highlight data or their annotation data to a note-taking app like this, it's very common that they're gonna go back and start to mess around with the text that's up here. For some people that might be like taking a note beneath, you know, for others that might be, you know, linking their, their thinking, so to speak, and creating uh, wiki links within the highlights. So we want to be very, very, very careful never to go back and overwrite something you did. So this plugin is entirely what we call append only. It will only ever Nice. Add stuff to the very bottom. So, you know, if you edited stuff and then you took new highlights and how to take smart notes on your Kindle and you woke up in the morning, what I would get based on how my template is set is I would get, you know, this at the bottom it would look like this and then it would be a date time uh, appended there. And then the new highlight would be down here. Does that make sense? It does. And that's, that's really part of the holy grail of things. I mean, I think auto updating, wherever we can add that within our personal knowledge systems, um, that's very important because for me to have trust in something, what I do is I'll go into books that I've read and right there underneath the highlight, I want to connect it, you know, using prompts like, hey, this reminds me of blank. And now, now I'm off in this other space. And my, my big fear with these, these products until up until now, really, is that if I do all this stuff and then I resync, that is going to overwrite. I'm going to lose the real valuable stuff for me, which is my personally meaningful connections to this book and how it relates to everything else in this rich tapestry, this web of other ideas, memories that I've encountered. And so what you're telling me, which is pretty amazing, is that this won't overwrite. It only appends. And that uh, seems small, but it's actually quite huge because now we can trust and rely on our note making space to to always be there and not um, be overwritten. Yeah, that's huge. You mentioned that that's the the holy grail. Actually, I would say the holy grail, which someday will be possible for us. Um, it's just that this like block based architecture is so new. The holy grail for us, um, which hopefully in the next year or two is possible is what we call bi directional sync. So if you were to update something here, this would go back into Readwise and update the record in Readwise. So now the two oh. are in total sync. Um, it's going to be interesting to see which note-taking app enables that first. Um, right now, wow. we've had to basically hack our exporting onto top of Notion and Rome because neither have uh, public APIs. Uh, it might be possible that Obsidian is first just because they, they're moving so quickly on the plugin system. We'll see. But that to us is the holy grail. That's pretty cool. I wasn't aware of that. That's awesome. Yep. You know, Obsidian makes me think of, um, I'm trying to think of this thing because it allows all these APIs like to connect to it. 
I might be using that incorrectly, but it reminds me of like Howell's Moving Castle. It's like this thing that you can like connect all these parts to, and it just seems like it's this customized version of whatever works for your for your bespoke needs, you know. Um, and so it's pretty wild to think about how it could be first because you know, right now your developers are like, oh no, what, what, what's Daniel saying out loud? <laughs> That's a pretty hard one to solve. Um, but that would be pretty wild, the bi-directional syncing. Yeah, um, we can't wait. And then uh, on this topic of readwises, append only. So a lot of times when people are getting this all set up and, and getting it dialed in, uh, they'll wanna do a couple tests. So there is a way to do that. I'm gonna go kind of off script here rather than walking through all this different templating. So like, let's say you want to um, like re-export something, but the, it's really, really, really easy to do in Obsidian compared to Notion or Roam. And all you have to do is you have to come in and you have to delete um, the export. So I have this article open to kind of demonstrate. Let me see if I can find it here. I'm hitting control O. It's called, here's how the metaverse, here it is. So you can see that I, I highlighted this using the Readwise um, web highlighter and exported it. And here's that highlight right here. Okay. Mm -hmm. if, I, if I click this, by the way, it'll, it'll take me back into the page. All right, but now let me take another highlight. Sorry, let's just highlight this real quick. So now let me rerun the, the same. Might take a second. Um, and what we wanna see is we wanna see, this is the original highlight and then we'll see new highlights added. Then there'll be a date time. And then this new highlight that I just took at the bottom. Mm -hmm. And so on the right, there are a few building exports. And as we see that, that means it's working. Right. I mean, is there anything? That's right. Yeah. And we've gotten, a, we only launched this publicly last Tuesday. So we're literally a week into this and gathering feedback for a V2. Um, one piece of feedback we've gotten is that these are annoying. And one of the community plugins figured out how to tap into this bottom status bar. So I think we're going to do that in the V2 oh. that's coming. Um, Very cool. But yeah, this is basically the server saying that it's doing work. And I just have an egregious number of highlights. Okay, so here you go. You can see that it was is added um, at 1221. My local time is 1222. So that's the append only relationship. Uh, but now let's delete this. And then if I rerun the sync, it may take a second. Uh, when it comes back in, it won't have that um, new highlights added header divider because now it's a fresh note we basically have refreshed it so if you came in to here and you wanted to play around like maybe a lot of people don't want bullets for their highlights they want block quotes like i was using by default it will be a bullet um, i already changed it to be a block quote um, you might like mess around with that delete the file resync it make sure it looks good and then when you're happy with it re re-import everything very cool. Metaverse. All right. Yeah. And there you can see it re, re exported fresh. And now these are each individual block quotes rather than that divider. So that's a pretty good example, especially with articles. I can see that being quite helpful as opposed to it depends what everyone's workflow is. Because with the book, you're probably taking that, you know, those, um, you know, concepts, wrestling with them and, and then making some connections. So then that's where I just loved, and I'm fine with the, the append where it goes below, you know, cause that's actually, it's, it is more, it's contextual in its own way. It's saying, well, this was taken later. And so it, if that's five years later, that is greatly impactful about when you're trying to recall it, you're kind of, you're choosing to use your own personal chronological experience to recall information in that book versus using something like the the arbitrary table of contents so yeah i'm, I'm really fine with just the append with highlights at yep. the bottom another piece of feedback we've gotten over the past week is we do have a highlight date that you took it there are some exceptions there like we don't get that data perfectly from kindle but as long as you're consistently syncing we can get pretty close 
Um, and people want that as a variable that they can add into their highlight template. So we can also add the date that the highlight was taken as another piece of metadata. So that's on our V2 roadmap. Oh, wow. um, what, else, hey, what else is on the V2 roadmap? So uh, yeah, good question. So the first thing that's on the roadmap, probably the most requested thing is there's no way right now in the template to edit the folder name and file name convention. If you don't like these folders, you can flatten them into one folder up here by this group categories and folder if you turn this on or off. Um, but in terms of being able to change these names, if you do like the folders, you know, I, we do have international folks who are like, we don't want the English names here. Um, so folder naming and then file naming convention, because obviously the file name is what's used as the um, reference throughout the rest of Obsidian, right? Like, mm -hmm. What I mean by that is, you know, if I come here, it'll try to auto complete seven powers. People might want more customization, like they might want seven powers dash or hyphen the author name. So folder mm -hmm. and file name templating is the number one requested feature since we've gone live that I think we're going to be able to accommodate. There might be a technical issue, but I'm 90% confident we'll be able to accommodate. Um, the second most requested feature for V2 would be to be able to use this plugin on mobile. Um, mm -hmm. I, I don't think there should be any issues with that. We just need to be very careful that if you run this on desktop and then you run it on mobile, that you won't get two of everything or have like a duplication issue. Mm -hmm. um, and then and then just a couple more variables in this templating. Those are the, the main things that have come up. Yeah, it, it's good to get your insights on that because uh, I do think this is a crowd, my, myself included. I mean, they're... Part of my whole thing is I want to get people actively thinking more, but there are times, and part of that active thinking can go into the world of fiddling. <laughs> and fiddling's fun. And that's what we can do with the settings here. I think this uh, a lot of people who have joined us in the lighthouse, that they're fiddlers as well. <laughs> and you know, renaming the folders, renaming the file names, uh, that's, that's pretty cool because then you can add your emojis, you can do whatever it is. Um, I like to actually go chronologically, so I like to add the the actual year um, that the book came out, um, and just kind of build build sense through the chronological order of things. Totally. Oh, and then the other thing that's also quite requested is to be able to filter what gets exported. Um, when I expand this, this will show every single probably have two thousand documents in here. Um, right now you can only do it based on time, but uh, we're looking into being able to subset, like only export my books or only export my tweets, what have you. And that's that's also on the roadmap. That's pretty cool. Yeah, I mean, so just to quickly walk through the other um, template options here, this one right here, highlight, this is probably the, the meatiest one. This controls what individual highlights look like when they're exported. So here you can see that I've exported this as a block quote. In Obsidian, you need to have a new line between block, block quotes, otherwise they smash together. Um, you can see that I'm also exporting this link at the end for view, hi view highlight to go back to the original. Um, you can see that that's kind of embedded in here with the highlight location. Um, so that's what this highlight thing is modifying. Also, if I had notes or tags, let me go over to how to take my notes. Um, if I have highlights or tags, for me, I export those as a sub bullets, you know, tags, colon, and then the note, uh, the, the tags themselves in Wikilink format. Some people will swap that to be a hashtag and then my note that I took while I was reading it below. Um, so that's what this one is controlling. Uh, we talked about the YAML front matter at the very beginning, even though this comes low in the template, just because it's by default disabled. This obviously will be the front matter at the top of the markdown file. And then this final one is called sync notification. Uh, this is much more relevant in Rome, which, um, you know, by default embeds linked re references onto pages a little bit more aggressively than what Obsidian does, where it's kind of relegated to a side panel. But this, this will populate a file, um, which will probably also customize. It'll populate a file in the readwise folder called like Readwise Sync Notifications. And every time Readwise does a sync and adds new content to your vault, 
it will write something there based on whatever um, template you put in here. So that can be a good way to kind of backlink and get stuff onto your daily note if you have a daily note workflow and you have a way of, of linking references. Okay. And just zooming out. So this is, I'm not a programmer and I was able to work with all this to kind of have my own custom settings, but this is Python, a form of Python. Is that accurate or what is the yeah, language? This is, this is called the Jinja 2 template. Jinja, okay. Yeah, a templating engine. And if ever you're confused, you can always just hit the documentation here. Oh. Um, and this will take you to our help page and, and here it will give a lot of suggestions. I need to fix this. <laughs> it's all bolded, but. Uh, I love the documentation. I, I And, you know, because I think I was looking at it before you went official. I didn't, the documentation wasn't ready there. So you can still figure it out without the documentation. I am really excited though to dive into that. Um, since yep. I am not coming from a programming background, I'm sure I'm going to learn quite a bit from that. And then um, you can always find the documentation within Obsidian itself. And then, you know, because we are a paid product, um, we are providing a service here. We take customer service and customer success very seriously. Um, so you can always just email us and, Myself, Aaron, Angie uh, will be very responsive, uh, both with feedback and with questions or comments. Another exciting thing, and that's where I'm, I'm new to this world, so I'm probably speaking outside of my area of expertise, but um, it seems like there are some commonalities really between how Readwise, how, how you've set up what you do, and how the Obsidian team has set up what they do. The things that stand out to me is how responsive you are to feedback from everybody, and how good naturally, how you take it with good nature. It's, it's kind of hard, you know, when everyone's asking for a million different features. And then the other one that's kind of interesting because I was doing some research into, you know, how, how everyone started, how you, you guys started Readwise and you aren't taking VC money, you're bootstrapping, which is also what Obsidian's up to. I know this kind of off of the, the, um, the sync between Readwise and Obsidian, but I'm just kind of curious you know, why was that decision made? What, what are your thoughts overall on what that does? You know, not having VC money. Yeah, I mean, Tristan and I, like I mentioned, we started in 2017 and we worked on it for about a year as kind of like a side project. I mean, I remember describing this back in 2017, like, oh, a browser extension that gets your Kindle highlights and resurfaces them to you. Like uh, people would not think that's the most interesting thing to be spending your time on. Um, at that time, we would use words like space repetition, um, and people would look at us like we had two heads. We're fortunate in that the past year or two, these have, have entered a little bit of like the early mainstream. But um, in 2018, a year after working on this, we had to decide like, all right, are we going to continue to work on this? And if so, how are we going to capitalize the business? Um, and we are not like dogmatic bootstrappers. Like there's this whole crowd of like indie hackers who are very anti VC for a variety of reasons. We're pretty um, agnostic when it comes to like what, you know, VC versus bootstrapping. At the end of the day, we just want to do what's best for the business and what's best for the business is what's best for our customer. And what's best for our customer is we're a very niche product. Um, we, we cater very deeply to a very small niche of user out there. Um, and if we took VC, we would be forced to go and uh, expand our offering to go after a larger market and kind of dilute our value proposition to our power users. So that was ultimately what drove the decision to uh, fund this business through revenues as opposed to raising venture capital. And uh, you know, looking back with the benefit of like three years now, it definitely was the right move and we're glad we did it. It definitely took a while before we got to a place where we felt that good. It wasn't really till like late 2019, early 2020, when our space, you know, thanks to tools like Obsidian and Rome and Notion really exploded uh, that, that we were in a good position. But now uh, we're in a pretty solid place and, and very happy that we were able to kind of stay focused on our core customer rather than, you know, go, go after some bulge in the market. And we really respect the way the Obsidian guys are are doing things like there's a lot we can learn from them their ability to foster a community such as yours it's just been unbelievable 
Uh, they definitely had a lot of foresight when with how they built this to be kind of plug in first and, and very, very, very customizable. Um, we're definitely very impressed with what they've done. Yeah. Well, hey, th thanks for providing that sort of perspective to the conversation and I having that sort of agnostic approach to the VC and how, you know, for for people using Readwise, understanding where you're coming from and what your your goals are and how you prioritize, I think is is valuable to know. Because there's an investment that goes both ways. It's not just, you know, the monthly or the annual, but it's also, you know, do we do we trust everyone here to steward their product in a way that meets my personal needs or, you know, so it's really great getting that insight, I think. Um, we, we're gonna, going to open it up for Q&A pretty soon here, but I want to make sure we also cover anything else. How are you doing so far with everything there, Daniel? Is there anything that we're, we should still uncover? Yeah, I mean, just a couple other aspects of the plugin that we didn't hit. Um, you can notice here, my vault is named Readwise, but within this vault, there's a folder named capital R Readwise, which contains all my, my highlight. Um, you can change the name of that from Readwise to whatever you might prefer uh, using this option within the plugin. Um, you can also customize uh, how often the sync runs. Right now I've got it set to manual, meaning I need to either hit this initiate sync or use the command panel like we showed at the very beginning in order to trigger resync. Alternatively, I can set it to run periodically. And this will tell the Obsidian plugin, go check the Readwise servers. If there are new highlights that I took between the last sync and now, then update my vault. Um, there's another sync option down here, which is what I use sync automatically when Obsidian opens. So when I open this vault, it will trigger this plugin and it will search. Um, it's really up to you what you prefer. And then this final um, option, resync delete files. This is on by default. So if I want to refresh, um, if I want to refresh one of these, just because maybe the table of contents didn't come in right, or maybe I decided to uh, tweak my template, all you have to do is come in here, delete the file, trigger a resync, um, and then everyone everything will come in. So those are the final plugin options. I do want to make everyone aware of two power user features. I mean, when we originally built these, it was like 90, we were 90% certain no one would ever use these, but they, it, the usage has kind of blown our minds. But you'll notice that like how to take smart notes has this very, very nice table of contents here. And you'll notice that most of my books do. Um, the way you get this in to both Readwise and then subsequently into Obsidian or Notion or Rome or Evernote, whatever you're using, is you use a feature that we call inline tagging. So um, we built this to be kind of reading app agnostic. It doesn't matter what you're in. And what you do is while you're reading, as you come across, you know, the chapter heading or the section heading or the part heading, as you highlight it, okay, and then you take a note and you start that note with a period or a dot and then an H, which is, you know, synonymous with like heading and then the heading hierarchy, right? So if the book has parts and chapters, the parts would be H1s, the chapters would be H2s. And then what this does is when Readwise imports these highlights, uh, right now the source is the Readwise uh, browser extension, but it could also be Kindle or Apple Books or Instapaper. It knows to translate this into the book's um, table of contents. So that's the first thing. The other, Related to this is you can also add tags um, while you're reading. And you do the same thing just by taking that period and then you could type, this is my tag. Obviously it can't identify spaces. That's why I'm using hyphens here. But when this imports into Readwise, this will be converted into a tag. And then you'll see that tag kind of dropped in right into um, the note, which is pretty cool because like, I have not come in here and linked anything. And like already you can see that, why is this not, here we go. Like this is just by virtue of me tagging while I read creates this insane knowledge graph. Um, so that's a, that's a feature worth noting for power users. So so as you make a highlight, you make a note, hit period, and it's either H or anything else will become a tag. H H one, H two, H three, all that yeah. stuff. 
otherwise it, be, it will become a tag. Yeah, I think that I think that covers kind of the ins and outs of the plugins. Um, unless there are any, yeah, anything you can think of that I missed, Nick? That answers all of my questions and gave me more insights about the roadmap for this plugin. I mean, I think that's one of the other things I'm looking for is you know dependability, and I I really like where Readwise has been, where it's going. And so I feel very good about using this and it's now a part of my workflow. Since it's so new, I haven't really used it um, excessively. And also because we're getting ready for a few other things. So I haven't been reading quite as much lately, but it is pretty freaking awesome. So this is, this is lovely. And I think we're about ready then to open it up for q and I'm going to start with Luke's question here. What plugin is Daniel using to highlight website articles? Is that the Readwise plugin or third party? Oh, good question. So this is a, a Readwise browser extension. We haven't actually gone live with this. It's um, still in development. But uh, if you email hello at readwise.io, Aaron and I will see that. And we can set you up with the, the beta version. But you could be using Hypothesis here. You could be using um, any of the other extensions where integrated with if you prefer. The cool thing about ours is that you can highlight images. Um, and so this image is highlighted with this text. So if I run this, I think this might take a second. I keep forgetting the name of this metaverse article. Here it is. Um, if we give this a second, it should come in and it'll have the image. You probably also notice like here, it's got the italics and here it's also got the hyperlink that was contained within this highlight. So we're the only highlighting tool I know of that's preserving formatting and taking taking images in. Oh yeah, here you can see the image. Um, wow. This is a little janky, but why did it do that? I think it probably just smashed. Here, it smashed. I don't get this. Um, here we go. But yeah, we'll we'll be releasing this in like the next month or two. This this browser extension, right here. Hey, hey Daniel, um, David Sparks has a question. He's asking, will the Readwise Web Highlighter plugin get Safari support as well? So Safari historically, Apple has made it very difficult to port browser extensions um, from Chrome, which has a dominant market share of the browser market, to Safari, which has a very small minority. So as developers when they keep rug pulling on us, you know, and creating weeks of work for us for no reason, it's very hard for us to willingly support Safari, which I know is frustrating as Safari is your preferred browser. That being said, Safari recently made it easier to port extensions over. Um, so it is on our roadmap to do. And um, as Paul knows, we're going to be porting this to Safari pretty soon. But that's, I'm just giving you some context as to why it's not like, something we do out of the gates it's just very frustrating they keep changing their standards and it creates a lot of unnecessary work for no reason i i think uh you must know this but the the idea of the readwise highlighter uh plugin as is is generating a lot of excitement in the in the chat and otherwise that's uh that's Sweet. pretty cool yeah just Where email if you guys want to get on the private beta just feel free to email me and aaron and we can hook you up daniel um where does firefox stand on the plugin list we have this for Firefox. That's what I thought. Firefox yes. uses um, Chrome extensions, but they have a more stringent uh, approval process, but we've been approved by them. Sweet. All right. I'm a Firefox user, so it's good to hear. Uh, David Sparks, hope you're doing well, David. Um, can you show again how you are doing block quotes and getting the blocks for ind individual quotes instead of groups? Uh, yes. So the one, by default, there'll be a dash here um, for a bullet. So I switched that dash to a block quote. And then the most important thing is I insert a new line down here. If you don't wow. insert this new line, it'll smash together. If you do put the new line here, then it will separate. And when it comes into Obsidian, it will have this very important space here, which makes it look separate. If I get rid of this space, you can see that it merges. That's just, I don't know why Obsidian chose to render black quotes this way, but they must have had a good reason. 
Very cool, very cool. Next one up. If we use data view, is it much better to include all hashtag metadata as a YAML at the top of the page? I Please. have never played with data view. I only learned about it while uh, in like the late stages of polishing this integration. So I would actually defer to you, Nick, if you're a data view expert. Yeah, I uh, actually am not. I'm pretty slow to the game with adopting uh, data view, although I think it's great and its functionality is fantastic. If we use data view, is it much better to include the metadata as YAML at the top of the page? Well, I guess the, my answer to that would be, I don't have a strong need to use YAML and sometimes it forces me to add things I don't want to add. So with that in mind, as I'm using data view, I'm just going to add the double colon, which allows it to be inline where data view can recognize. So, you know, instead of having to put it in the YAML in a specific format, especially the tags, uh, for me, I just prefer, you know, tags, colon, colon, then I can put my tags there. And then data view can recognize the inline uh, metadata. So I guess that would be my answer. Uh, moving on. What is the difference with the Kindle Obsidian plugin? That plugin is free. Are you, is your team aware of that? Uh, no, but I, I do think there's probably an opportunity for someone, I'm someone aware to of this do a one. comparison and compare kind of the pros and cons. Yeah, I'm aware of it. Um, again, I haven't been consuming too much right now, but uh, it's, it's pretty cool what Haiti did there. It doesn't have the functionality that is in this Readwise official. I think I don't think I don't think it can auto update without overriding, and and kind of for me that's number one on the list. But the fact that Haiti produced that, I, I was pretty impressed by. So definitely a round of applause for for his work. But um, someone else could again give more details to the compare and contrast, and that would be nice. But overall, I, I don't know if it does at this time do the auto updating without overriding. I think you have to delete. And so it's just a process there, but pretty cool that that was made. Next one, we have about 12 more minutes. If you change the name of the MD file in Obsidian or move its location, okay, we kind of covered that. That's, will any new highlights from Rewise still be added to the Wait, file? I think, I think that question, um, if you move this document you know, out, of the folder, readwise the extension will not be able to find it. So when you do another resync, it will create another seven powers within here. So unfortunately, we haven't figured out a way for you to be able to rename the file or move it uh, in terms of its um, location on your computer and still work. So everything kind of needs to stay where it is when it's exported. From Alfredo. What is the reading app that will provide the best experience in connecting Readwise with Obsidian? I could become reading app agnostic in exchange for the smoothest experience. Uh, it depends on what you're reading. So you've got books, which are a whole can of worms, um, you know, heavily protected by DRM, you know, so you need mm -hmm. to use some sort of ebook reading app. You've got the platforms, Kindle, Apple Books, and Google Play Books. Far and away, the best one is Kindle, um, just because they automatically sync to the cloud. Um, so that becomes a seamless experience. You know, I was reading last night in bed and reading this book by Edward Slingerland. I don't know why I formatted this way. I must have done something, but then it will appear in uh, Obsidian in the morning. If you're reading articles and web content, you've got the Read It Later apps like Instapaper and Pocket, and then you've also got the highlighting extensions such as the one that we were just messing around with here um, or hypothesis uh, unfortunately it's the paper and pocket haven't really been updated in like the past half decade but they are pretty dependable um, i much much prefer it's the paper to pocket because it lets you take notes and i believe that the best way to you know read between the lines is to write between the lines it you know, perplexes me that Pocket doesn't let you take annotations as you read, but some people prefer Pocket. Uh, and then there's PDFs, which are an incredibly frustrating file format, but obviously a very important part of any knowledge worker's workflow. Um, for that, I prefer an iPad with PDF Expert. 
uh, that's that's a particular app. You have to be careful what app you use when reading and highlighting PDFs because some don't actually create highlights. Instead, you're basically like drawing rectangles on top of the PDF. Um, and once you uh, highlight a PDF, you can email that file to Readwise, and then that'll parse and show up in here. So three different types of content. Unfortunately, it's a pretty unbundled space right now. So you need to set up your tool stack the right way. And then for podcasts, people really like this app called Air, um, where you can basically take highlights of podcasts. The PDF, okay. I also actually use PDF Expert. Good to hear that that's, um, I kind of just stumbled backwards into that one. So I'm, I'm happy to hear from you <laughs> that that's worth using. Now, but you're saying the highlights you make can also be imported into um, Obsidian? Or what was that workflow? I think I was looking at a comment. Yeah. And um, so you can highlight a PDF, um, as provided you're using the right app um, and provided that the PDF is encoded the right way. You know, you're not mm -hmm. just like looking at a scan. You can read a PDF and highlight it. And then that'll modify the PDF file. And you can send that modified PDF file to Readwise in a variety of different ways. Um, but the easiest way is just to email it to add at Readwise. .io. All the instructions are here, or you can drag and drop it. And then that PDF will parse out the highlights and then create um, a book or an article for you. And then that book or article will be exported to Obsidian. While we're on the topic of PDF stand, uh, Anders is asking, he says, I've read your FAQ about PDFs and all the challenges with them. Is PDF expert the best way to create highlights and annotations for parsing within Readwise? What are your thoughts on that? Um, on iPad, it definitely seems to be the most foolproof. On desktop, there's literally 200 different PDF readers. So it's really up to kind of personal preference and experimentation. My general advice is just um, find the app that suits you the best, test it with Readwise and see if it's creating real annotations for the PDF spec and, and go that way. But my personal preference for whatever that's worth is PDF expert on iPad. But I'm just gonna plug in my laptop. And that, that sort of begs the question when, when we talk about PDFs for the, you know, the hardcore academics and researchers, they, at least it makes me think of Zotero and how that workflow might look if somebody's comfortable with Zotero. Now, obviously a reference manager, you're getting a lot of that detail that you might need for citations. But I'm someone asked uh, Carbon SE asks here: Are Zotero or Paperpile in the roadmap for automatic importing into Obsidian? Mm, um, and I that might that might sorry that might actually go outside of what the intentions of Readwise. But uh, yeah, yeah, I can't speak to whether or not those apps are working on their own plugins with Obsidian, or if they they have APIs to enable someone in the community to pull them in. I. I don't really, we cater to more of like a, an autodidact than like the scholarly academic world. Um, don't get me wrong, there's some overlap there, but we're not really experts on reference managers. Um, so I can't really speak to that. Okay. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a tough one. I know there are some other tools and the good news is um, with Obsidian's architecture, you can use things like the plugin MD notes by Argentina and some other things and get a good Zotero workflow going on hmm. for those PDFs. That's great. Here's, here's a good one that I was kind of wondering myself, also from David, uh, thoughts on using a web plugin highlighter versus highlights in Instapaper. So for example, let, let's this new exciting Readwise plugin versus highlighting in Instapaper. It really comes down to personal preference. I've met people who, supporters of the open web are, pretty dogmatic, like, oh, the author made the page a certain way. Now, obviously this person is writing on Substack, so it's not like a whole lot of craft went into shaping how this looks. Uh, but there are people who believe that it's like betraying the author somehow to pull the content off and read it in a, in a different app. Um, so it really comes down to personal preference. I personally prefer reading in a very consistent, calm, space you know that tries to remove distractions and just focuses on the actual reading experience that's my personal preference but i mean just like the way people use obsidian and 
you know, some people want to use dashes for bullets, other people want to use asterisks, some people want block quotes. I think, I think this is uh, in the same vein. It really comes down to the person, what their workflow is like, what they're reading, uh, and, you know, their views towards the open web. Yeah, good points there. You bring up another one too about the the intention of how something should be read, which is a whole nother, like, you know, what is art, how it should be consumed. It makes me think of Netflix. They, I think they added the feature half a year, a year ago to watch content at 2x speed, like up to 2x. And, you know, if it's a feature film, it's by Christopher Nolan. I don't think there are any Christopher Nolan films on Netflix. But the point being is that's somebody who really wants to make sure that you experience his work in the theater and all that. And so, so that, yeah, the interesting side conversation that we won't go down that rabbit hole because Eric asks a great question. From a data protection standpoint, is all the Readwise data passed through from example, Kindle to the end user or is it stored in Readwise, Readwise's managed platform? It's stored in Readwise. The thing we didn't go into is kind of the core functionality of Readwise, which is this whole daily review. So we really have two value props. Uh, the one value prop that we focused on entirely during this conversation is kind of our Zapier syncing value prop, where we import from a variety of sources and then we export to a variety of destinations. But the core functionality is this like daily review, where it becomes this very uh, beneficial habit that people find very easy to maintain. In contrast to like Zettelkasten or Slipboxing or whatever, where you know, it's kind of like a new year's resolution. Everyone rushes in like, oh, this is going to be my year and change it, you know? And then after a month, they stop like doing it. This right here is like an easy daily habit. Like you can see, I have a 193 day streak. We have people who have been doing this every day without fail for three or four years straight. Like this is the core functionality of Readwise. And so we, we need to store highlight data in order to support this. Yeah, that's a good answer. And, um, you know, usually somehow you you did it with this feature like a lot of times there are good intentions that don't turn out well but the simplicity the kind of like the joy of clicking to review the daily review it somehow it's like the perfect balance uh, and it's a good example of how technology can help in the space repetition or the the learning process and re, re returning to things I think when I was younger, all I wanted to do was watch the next movie and the next movie and this or that to kind of build up how many things I've watched. But there comes a point when you kind of want to focus on and return to those movies or those books or those quotes that mean a lot to you. And so you have that as a easy to develop habit. And I think that's exactly. really what it's about. Yeah, I mean, most people we find or in this space have taken like hundreds, if not tens of thousands of highlights but they never go back and revisit them. So we make it easy to consistently review your highlights in a, in a yeah. way that is not guilt inducing. Exactly, yeah, very good. I have a few more Q and A questions. I wanna, I'm not sure if we'll have time for them. We're approaching the hour mark right now. I think uh, if people go to readwise.io slash LYT, they'll come through your link. Mm. So typically we're a paid product with a 30 day free trial, but if you come through this link, you'll get double the free trial. And if you already signed up during this, uh, but not through this link, just email um, hello at readwise.io and Aaron and I will, will fix that for you. That's very nice of you to bring that one up, Daniel. And uh, yeah, so full disclaimer here, this is the, it's kind of new to me, but this is the first affiliate sort of thing I've done. So I do get a kickback from this. Doesn't matter to me, use that link or not. Um, just being fully transparent for me to do something like this it's very important that i actually use it and pay for it and i pay for it out of my own pocket and you know the the company or whoever is not um paying me or giving me free access so it met all the criteria plus you know i, I love i love it and, I, and the team is fantastic so just want to be fully clear with everybody um i don't care if you use the affiliate link or not but um for what it's worth i use it i love it i'm excited to see how it continues building. And yeah, so thanks for bringing that, that up, that link. That's nice of you. And yeah, nice of Aaron to initially reach out. So uh, with that in mind, let's do one more clappity clap, raise hand clappity clap back and forth to thank you for your time. And I saw a lot of people in the chat uh, from the Obsidian forums and all sorts of different places. And it's kind of cool to see they've all converged here 
for this Readwise chat. It seems like it's kind of a broader group than some of the other uh, calls that we've had, which is quite interesting. With that in mind, let's do a few more questions. Let's see. Could the Readwise highlighter potentially replace Instapaper or Pocket, or is it not meant to? Absolutely. Definitely. And again, I think that ties into what you're saying about it's up to you with your reading experience. Yeah, I mean, some people use Pocket as more of like a, a bookmarking app than they do necessarily a reading app. And if you're using it as a bookmarking app, like to save a recipe or a YouTube video, the highlighter won't replace that. But if you're using it as a place to send content that you want to read and then highlight and annotate, the highlighting extension can definitely replace that. Have you considered exporting each highlight to an individual file for more atomic note taking? And there's yeah, a that's a good that, question. But... <laughs> um, obviously, Rome has a block based architecture in contrast to Obsidian, which is more page based. Um, so within Rome, each bullet becomes a block that can be referenced later. So it works nicely there. And we know, I didn't know this before this past week, but I guess a Rome clone called LogSec works, uh, complements Obsidian very nicely, and then it has a local first architecture and can kind of pick up on these files. So we're going to look into whether or not we can uh, accommodate LogSec even better, uh, or at least like users kind of using a combo of both apps. Notion, um, we export everything to a Notion database. And right now we kind of create a page within the database and then put in each highlight. Now, because it is a, a proper database, we could potentially put each database or put each highlight as a row into the database and make it individually referenceable. In Obsidian, um, it's, it's not obvious to us yet how we would go and we would turn every single highlight into its own file. I mean, it is technically feasible, but if I did it, I would have 36,000 files in my mm -hmm. vault. So we just need to think through like, all right, what do you name that, right? Like, what do you name the file for this highlight? Is it just like the book name and then like dash one and then dash two and it just kind of indexes. Mm -hmm. So there are a lot of product questions there that aren't obvious to us, but if there's enough demand and people have like ideas and use cases to how it can unlock value, we can definitely do it. Um, yeah. We did chat with a fellow who was using some plugin where you can like create like a block reference idea. It looks like that at the end and was basically backing into block level addressability within Obsidian, but I'm not enough of an Obsidian expert to um, teach that workflow. Yeah. I would, I would heartily recommend to go against making each highlight an atomic note. I know that might replicate um, some functionality in Outliner apps, but I think in the Obsidian infrastructure, I don't think it'll be helpful. Um, and again, your, your, your main way to recall or retrieve information is likely going to be from looking, let's imagine it's a book, going to the book, and then you have your list there. So when you're trying to find something, you that's the best way to go about it. If they're all individual notes with their... Uh, I mean, it's a mess for a few reasons. Not to say it can't be done. Everyone has a different, you know, here are the disclaimers. Everyone has a different workflow and need, but I would hardly rec heartily recommend not doing that. But it's a good question. How do you make the Obsidian index visible? Okay, that's more of an Obsidian question. Just quickly answering it. It's a folder on your computer. So you just have to find that folder on your computer. And that's one of the beauties of working in local plain text type of files. It's just there. Anders asks, it seems like you plan to add a ton of features over the coming months. Can you think of any do's and don'ts to be cautious of in the meantime, if you want to make use of new features when they come out and not lose work already done in your sitting vault with your imported highlights and notes? Hmm. Yeah, I mean, the file. if you intend to use a different file and folder naming scheme, I wouldn't invest too much into each of these. Um, otherwise, you'd kind of have to laboriously uh, go. Well, I guess what you could do is you could edit these files. And then once you come up with a new scheme, use whatever the scheme is uh, to like rename this. So if you want it to be uh, the book name dash author, 
you could go in heavily link this thing up or do whatever it is you're going to do to this file and then just pull it aside when you run the extension like put it into a different directory then you'll find a new seven powers um, and you can just go and replace it i don't think people can get through there might be an aspiration to sit here and spend like 40 hours going through each of these but i don't think people can like get through and process their notes at that high a volume so worst case you might have to manage like five or ten items um, that's going to be the main change that could screw you up. The mobile is going to be purely additive. I'm trying to think if there's anything else. I think that's it. Um, okay. Uh, a lot of people are asking about if the chat transcript itself will be saved. Um, yeah, it will be. It, I'm surprised that you're not allowed to just um, click into the chat, hit, uh, you know, select all and then copy that. But there will be a chat transcript. How we share it, I don't know. There'll probably be a link to the eventual YouTube video, and then you can just download it from there. So um, that will probably be the plan. OK. We are getting close to the very end. Last open question. Carmen, OK, direct import into Obsidian was a typo into Readwise. So I guess Zotero into Readwise integration. Is that, and I think you, you're probably not too focused on that. Again, you're focused on the autodidact versus the- Well, we heard Zotero, I mean, it, I'm not sure where it sits in terms of like commercial to open source, but I have heard from users that they're working. When I think of Zotero, I think of its application a couple of years ago where you're basically using it to uh, carry a lot of metadata about your sources for some sort of academic purpose and then it generates like a bibliography or citations that you can then use to properly cite in your writing app, be it like Microsoft Word or whatever. Um, I have heard that Zotero is moving into also being a PDF reader. Is that what's being asked? Like if you take highlights in Zotero as a PDF reader? Because I think for the longest time it couldn't handle like any reading of its own. And we can only integrate with apps where you can take highlights because that's how our atomic unit is a highlight the same way that you know obsidians is a page so if you can't take a highlight in zotero there's really no way for us to interface with it but i do know that zotero has been working on a pdf reader but i didn't know if it was available yet yeah i, I don't know if it's still in beta or not i'm sure people on the call do know but um that'll be interesting to see what develops along that flow because if you are taking Zotero to make highlights, then you just have a choice. Do you want to go directly to Obsidian via a different workflow? Or in the future, is there a way to you know, connect it to Readwise, which will then go to Obsidian with the same type of workflow as books and articles, tweets, and all the other Interesting. stuff? Interesting. Well, I mean, if they, if they do the PDF reader, and I do think they have a plugin system, um, I, think, I think we probably will be able to support them in the future. We don't currently well, I, do it. That would be quite interesting, I think, because it's, I, I know, like you said, the, the main focus is on the self-learner, but the academic and the researcher, that might be kind of a nice entry point for them because, you know, and Zotero being their, their Absolutely. main tool of choice, I, I could be wrong, but Zotero seems to be the main reference manager. So connecting that to a unified workflow, hmm, that's interesting. <laughs> It's definitely, uh, it's definitely what we're about. Yeah. I think this is, yeah, us academics really love Readwise too. Um, okay. So I think that's basically it. We'll get everyone out um, just a little over. We've answered all the questions, many questions, 27 just in the Q&A. And I know there were probably just as many in the chat. So Aaron, you're really on top of that, just flying around. <laughs> Thank you. And there were a Hopefully lot of questions. Got everyone. I think you did. So are there any final words, last thoughts? It was fun. It was really great to read all of your questions. Um, if anyone slipped through the cracks, if you guys have questions that come out, up after this, um, you guys, I'll pop this in the chat, but you can email hello at readwise.io and either Angie or myself will, will get back to you pretty promptly. Um, but yeah, I hope this was helpful for everyone. It was helpful for me to see how people are using the tool. Yeah, at the end of the day, we really, we really do two things, the Readwise, and that's 
build product and talk to our users. So uh, feel free to reach out with any questions or comment or feedback you have. Um, I'm sure as you guys know, through being in the Obsidian community, like some people can get very edge casey and it's hard for us to develop a whole feature for, for one user. But what we try to do is we try to receive all the feedback and synthesize it and then develop something that can serve as many people as possible in the best way possible. Yeah. Well, I think the good news is here, most everybody, if you're, if you're on this call, you're probably patient and understandable that just because you have whatever random edge case, you can't just snap your fingers and, and, and the magic happens. But uh, I, do, I do feel quite good in trusting you know, this part of the workflow to, to the folks at Readwise. And that's, that, mean, that means a lot. You know, I prefer to use as few tools as possible and just make sure that they're reliable workflows I'm kind of past the stage where I just want to try a million different things. I just want to kind of settle in, hunker down and start developing ideas, compounding my value. And, uh, you know, that's where, that's where it gets pretty fun. So yeah, last round of applause. Thank you so much, Daniel and Aaron. Um, this was just fantastic. I learned quite a bit, just amazing. So Woo. awesome. Thank you for having Thank us. Yeah. Having it was a okay. delight. Until next time. Bye, everyone. All right. Thank you, everyone. All right. See ya.